Okay, great. Uh, well, we're switching gears here a little bit for this session, and uh, we're going from biology to astronomy, and uh, we're talking about our universe and the age of uh, how old is it. Now, when you, you go out from the, in the country, uh, far away from the big city lights, and you look up at the night sky, especially on a clear winter night, and you look up all those stars, it's so easy to affirm what King David wrote. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament, or the expanse, shows his handiwork. But we're being told, aren't we, however, that that's not the case. We're being told by television shows, popular science magazines, and professional scientists that our universe, rather than declaring God's glory, is the result of a cosmic accident that they call the Big Bang. And it's kind of an explosion, but it's not an explosion in the normal sense of the word. They're claiming that space itself exploded and that somehow we are here as a result of all of that. Now, there are lots of problems with the Big Bang. Uh, no Christian should be intimidated into accepting it. And we could spend an entire presentation on just problems with the Big Bang. But I want to point out one really uh, glaring problem is that the Big Bang has a hard time explaining the origin of stars. Now, it's not that they don't have a theory. They claim that stars form from these giant gas clouds in space. But, you know, gases tend to expand, okay? And you don't have giant pistons out in space in order to compress the gas. You've got to compress the gas if you want to make it turn into a star. So they think that you can have shocks from these explosions that can compress the gas and make this work. Uh, and they say that uh, the source for these shocks are exploding stars. Okay, well, I guess that's all well and good, I suppose, but where did the first stars come from? You know, if your explanation for star formation requires one generation of stars to already be in existence, you've got a problem. So there's lots of problems with this Big Bang, but one of the key elements is that it is the idea of an un unimaginably old universe. They're claiming... The universe is almost 14 billion years old, and yet Scripture clear, clearly teaches a recent creation, sometime around 6,000 years ago. Now, despite what you see on TV or read in magazines, science cannot tell us the age of the universe, and the reason for that is really simple. Uh, age isn't something you measure in a laboratory. Okay, Anytime you hear a scientist talking about these age estimates, these are always calculated numbers based on assumptions about the past, and those age estimates are only as good as the assumptions behind them. Now, creation scientists and evolutionary scientists have very different starting assumptions. We creationists affirm biblical creation and a global flood, and evolutionary scientists deny those things. Now, they may disagree on a lot, but the one thing that all evolutionists agree on is that God did not make the universe in six days, and there was not a global flood in the days of Noah. And they hold to a philosophy called uniformitarianism. And it's summarized by the motto, the present is the key to the past. So they think that natural processes we see going on today have always acted at more or less the same rates and intensities. And they would say, for instance, if you're a uniformitarian geologist, you would look at something like the Grand Canyon, and you would say that since erosion today is slow, it has always been slow. And therefore, it took millions of years for that canyon to be carved out. And they don't consider the possibility that maybe erosion was much faster at some time or times in the past. Now, the world is going to try to make you feel foolish for holding to recent creation. They want you to think that you're committing intellectual suicide if you believe what the Bible says about the age of the universe. And I want to give you three reasons uh, that you can be confident, every Christian can be confident that biblical recent creation is more reasonable than the Big Bang. And the first reason is that even when we make assumptions that are very generous to the Big Bang and generous to uniformitarianism, our solar system really looks young. And we're going to see a lot of evidence of that, of that this evening. Uh, for instance, comets, okay, they limit the age of the solar system to tens of thousands of years, not even millions of years, or even billions of years. So the solar system looks really young. Also, there's a creation scientist named Russ Humphreys who used biblical assumptions to make a bunch of successful predictions 
about the magnetism or magnetic fields of bodies in our solar system. Okay, and this is Russ Humphreys right here. Actually, he made, uh, I only have time to really show you a couple of those uh, successful predictions, but we could talk about a lot more. Okay, and that's a clue that we're on the right track. Now, as soon as we talk about the age of the universe, you know, you have your skeptics here who say, well, what about distant starlight? How do you explain that, Mr. Creationist? Okay, and so here's the issue. Now, the apparent problem is, is that a light year is the distance traveled by light in one year. It's about six trillion miles. Well, we know that there are distant galaxies that are billions of light years away from us. Therefore, shouldn't it take billions of years for that light to reach here? Okay? And to make matters worse, there are some processes going on in deep space that seem to demand large amounts of time. For instance, you have galaxies that are colliding. And if you think about how far apart those galaxies are and how fast they're moving relative to one another, it looks like these collisions ought to take millions of years. And so the third point here is that even though we may not have all the answers yet, we've got plausible solutions to hard questions like how can we see distant starlight in a young, young universe? So what I want to do now is I want to just take you on a little tour of our solar system and we're going to see evidence that our solar system is young. Now, we're going to start out uh, outside our own Milky Way galaxy, and we're going to zoom in at warp factor 7 or 8 uh, toward our own solar system. And uh, the most prominent object in the solar system, of course, is the sun. And evolutionary scientists claim that the sun formed from a rotating cloud of gas and dust billions of years ago. And they call this the nebular theory. Uh, they've got different versions of it, and there's lots of problems with this theory, and we're going to see a problem with it later on in this talk. So how old is the sun? Is it really billions of years old? Do you have to believe that it's billions of years old? Well, there was a famous solar astronomer named John Eddy who said, he kind of created a little bit of a ruckus a while back when he said, you know, I think we could live with an age of 6,000 years for the Earth and the sun. Uh, in the terms of astronomical evidence, there's really not much to conflict with that. Now, he believed that the Earth and Sun were billions of years old, but he said there's nothing in astronomy that really forces us to reach that conclusion. In fact, if you believe the Sun is billions of years old, you've got a big problem called the young faint Sun paradox. And it's kind of ironic that it was the late Dr. Carl Sagan who was famous for going on about billions and billions of years he was one of the first people to realize this problem. You see, based on their understanding of how stars evolve and change over time, they think that 4 billion years ago, our sun would have been 30% dimmer, and the earth would have received a lot less sunlight, and the earth would have been frozen. Now, the problem for evolutionists is that most evolutionists have long said that the earth was warm billions of years ago. So one part of the evolutionary story is contradicting another part, and that's why they call it a paradox. Now, every now and then in the popular science literature, you'll see claims that they solved this. This one's from 2010. Okay, they said they solved it, and a year later they said, oops, not so fast, maybe we didn't solve it after all. Uh, 2013, they're still working on it, and they're still working on it in 2016. You get the idea, okay? They don't have it solved, and I don't think they will ever solve it because this is a huge problem for them. But if you believe in recent creation, it's not a problem because you don't expect the brightness of the sun to change very much in just a few thousand years. It's only a problem if you believe the sun is billions of years old. So now we're going to move on into the innermost uh, planet of the solar system, the planet Mercury. And uh, maybe it's just me, but I have the sneaking suspicion that when the Lord Jesus comes back, he's going to make us change the names of these planets, okay? Uh, you know, he is a jealous God, after all. Um, but Mercury looks young. It has a magnetic field. Now, why does a magnetic field for something like Mercury in, imply youth? Well, evolutionary scientists, they, they believe that these bodies in space have had magnetic fields lasting for billions of years. And... In order for that to work, you have to have something called a dynamo or a natural dynamo. And they have a theory about how this could work. It doesn't work very well, but a critical part of this theory is that the body, the moon or the planet, has got to have a liquid core. 
It's got to have a liquid core. Now, the problem for them is after billions of years, for small bodies, that liquid core should have frozen and you should no longer have a magnetic field, okay? Uh, and so this is a general problem, okay? As a general rule, if you have a relatively small body like a moon or, or so, a small planet and it's still warm, that is usually going to be a problem for billions of years. Maybe not always, but most of the time it is. So they were not expecting Mercury to have a magnetic field, so they were surprised when the Mariner 10 spacecraft detected that magnetic field. Uh, because again, it's small, it should have cooled off eons ago. And now we're going to um, uh, visit a visitor to our solar system, a comet, and I think most of you have heard about these dirty snowballs. When they come near the sun, okay, the, the radiation from the sun causes the ices on that nucleus to, vapor, nucleus to vaporize, and you get these nice, beautiful tails. So they lose a little bit of material each time they come near the sun, and so they're like melting ice cream cones. They have finite lifetimes that are typically measured in tens of thousands of years. And yet, evolutionary scientists claim that these are leftovers from the formation of the solar system billions of years ago. So how then can we still see comets? Well, we think the answer is obvious, okay? They're not billions of years old. Now, evolutionary scientists, they're aware of this problem, and they claim that there are these reservoirs of icy bodies that can replenish or restock the solar system with new comets, okay? And they've got, and they've got two of these proposed reservoirs, and that's because you have different kinds of comets. They have different orbital characteristics and you need more than one reservoir to try to explain all of them. Uh, and uh, you've got some uh, comets that go around the sun fairly quickly in less than 200 years. Those are the short period comets. And then you've got others that take longer. Those are the long period comets. And the short period comets, you can further subdivide those into what are called the halotype and the Jupiter type comets dependent on their characteristics. So to give you a feel for the kind of problems they have, this is a paper from 2014 where they're trying to explain where do the Halley-type comets come from. And at first they said, well, okay, they're coming from the scattered disk. But then they thought, oh, wait, we don't have enough material there for that to work. So they said, okay, well, maybe they're coming from the Oort cloud. That's all well and good, but even Carl Sagan acknowledged there's not a shred of direct evidence that the Oort cloud even exists. It's totally hypothetical because they had to cook it up to explain how they can still have comets after billions of years. Okay, so the bottom line is that these reservoirs just don't work very well. Okay, and, there, and there's a good chance one of them doesn't even exist. Um, now we're gonna go into uh, the next planet in our solar system, and that's Venus. And uh, Venus, the surface looks young, okay? In fact, there are indications that it is still geologically active even today. Now, that doesn't necessarily prove that it's just thousands of years old, but it's certainly consistent with a, a, a young age. Now, I'm hoping everybody recognizes this next stop on our tour, okay, because this is home, okay, the Earth, and uh, there's some interesting things about the geography of Earth. 71% of the Earth's surface is underwater, most of the land surface is covered by water-deposited rocks, what we call sedimentary rocks. And within those water-deposited rocks, you have the fossilized remains of billions of plants and animals. Now, we creationists think, oh, that sounds a lot like you would expect from the Genesis flood. And uh, that's what we're arguing. So we're saying that rather than be, being evidence for millions of years, those rocks and fossils are evidence for the Genesis flood. Now, we've got a lot of indicate, eight indicators that the Earth is young. Uh, Earth's magnetic field is strong evidence that the Earth has to be young. Now, remember, they're trying to explain how the Earth and these other bodies can have a magnetic field lasting for billions of years. They're trying to use this dynamo theory. But not too long ago, a geophysicist said, you know, we don't really know how the Earth can maintain a magnetic field for billions of years. And we know now, we, we know now uh, we have less of an understanding now than we thought we did a decade ago, okay? And it gets worse than that, because based on historical measurements over the last couple of hundred years, we know that the energy of the Earth's magnetic field is rapidly decreasing. 
Now, if you run the numbers backwards, say 20 or 30,000 years, the energy of the field is so big that the electrical current required to produce it would produce enough heat to melt the Earth's crust and mantle. And that is a big problem, okay? So this is strong evidence that the Earth and its magnetic field can only be thousands of years old. Uh, now we're going to take a trip to uh, the nearest neighbor in space. That's the moon. And the moon really gives evolutionists a hard time when they're trying to explain the, its existence. Now they claim that a Mars-sized body slammed into the Earth and somehow the moon formed from that. Uh, but they, they really have a tough time. In fact, there was a famous Harvard astrophysicist who was once quoted as, as saying, the best explanation for the moon is observational error. The moon doesn't exist. Okay? So I, I don't know, maybe the moon's playing peekaboo with us or something when nobody's looking. I'm not sure how that's supposed to work. But that gives you a feel for just how much trouble they have when it comes to explaining the moon. Now, the moon is relatively small, and they think it should have cooled off billions of years ago. In fact, you can go on the internet and find some outdated websites that still claim that the moon has been geologically dead for the last three billion years. But we now know that is not true. These, these linear things you see on the surface there, those are called scarps. And there are these geological features that are forming because the moon's crust is still cooling off. And it's shrinking a little bit. And it's causing these, these scarps, these escarpments that you see here. And uh, the secular scientists were completely shocked by that because they, again, they think the moon is four and a half billion years old. It should have cooled off a long time ago, and this shouldn't be happening. But it is happening. And that's an indication that the moon is a lot younger uh, than what they say. Our next stop is the red planet, Mer um, I'm sorry, Mars, not Mercury. Uh, and they very much want to find evidence of life on Mars uh, because they think that will make the evolutionary story seem a little more believable. Uh, they haven't turned up anything yet, and I don't think they will, but they also think there's geologic evidence of catastrophic flooding on Mars. Now, I'm okay with that. Most creationists are. Uh, we don't have a problem with that, although it's kind of interesting. Evolutionary geologists are okay with flooding on Mars. There's not a drop of liquid Mars, a liquid water on Mars today. But you know, we live on a water world, and they say there's no evidence for a global flood. Okay, so we think they're being just a little bit inconsistent there. Okay, so uh, we're going to now go to the outer solar system. Okay, Jupiter is our next stop, and of course, it's famous for its very large size and its its beautiful red spot and those beautiful bands. Uh, that make it so colorful. I'm not going to say a whole lot about Jupiter, except that evolutionary astronomers have had a long, has had a hard time explaining how Jupiter could form. Okay, it's given them a lot of trouble over the years. But what I really want to look at is some of the moons of Jupiter. Now, this is Io. It's one of uh, the larger moons of Jupiter. It's the most volcanically active body in the solar system. But it, you know, compared to you know the size of a planet, it's pretty small. So how has it retained the energy to drive those volcanoes for billions of years? It should have cooled off a long time ago. Now, evolutionary scientists are aware of this. You know, whenever they encounter this, they claim that something called tidal flexing is heating up the crust, you know, where you can have these gravitational tugs that kind of stretch and compress the crust and warm it up. Uh, but it's not quite that simple, and there's some reasons to think that that in and of itself is not a good explanation for the volcanism on Io. Io really does look young. Now, this is another one of Jupiter's moons. It's called Ganymede, and it's got a magnetic field, and guess what? It bothers evolutionists for the same reason that Mercury's magnetic field bothers them, okay? It's, this is a relatively small body. It should have cooled off e eons ago. No liquid core and no magnetic field, and yet it does. Now, of course, they knew about tidal flexing before they found out that uh, Ganymede had a magnetic field, but they still weren't expecting it to work. Now, today, they have to say it's tidal flexing because we know that it does have a magnetic field, but they weren't expecting it, okay? They didn't think originally that tidal flexing would work, and I'm, I'm not sure that tidal flexing will work, but there's not a problem if it's young, okay, it's no surprise that Ganymede could have a magnetic field. 
Uh, now we're going to head on out to the, uh, the next planet. Uh, that's Saturn. And of course, Saturn is famous for its very beautiful rings. And those rings are young. They are definitely young. Uh, because they're made up of ice particles, and those ice particles are constantly being pelted with space dust. And so you would expect that over time they would get dark and sooty. They would probably be the color of charcoal, but they're not. They're still very bright and shiny, and even the secular scientists have had to admit these rings cannot possibly be more than 300 million years old. Now remember, they think the planet Saturn is 4.5 billion years old. Okay? Okay. Uh, now, could it be younger than that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, could it be 6,000 years old? Sure. Okay, that's just a maximum possible age if you make evolutionary assumptions. But the true age can certainly be less than that. And I think the true age of Saturn and its rings is 6,000 years. Now, we're going to look at one of uh, Saturn's moons. It's called Titan. It's got a nitrogen atmosphere, but there's also some methane in that atmosphere. And that methane is being broken down by ultraviolet radiation, but there's no evidence that it's being replaced. And that puts an upper limit on the age of the atmosphere of anywhere from 10 to 100 million years. Okay, now could the true age be less than that? Could it be 6,000 years? Absolutely. And I think that is the true age of Titan. Uh, the next stop on our tour is Uranus. And Uranus is interesting uh, because it, it rolls on its side. You know, the other planets, they spin like tops, but Uranus rolls like a wheel on its side. And that's a problem for this nebular theory because if you believe everything formed from this rotating cloud of gas and dust, everything ought to be spinning the same way. Okay, you shouldn't have something spinning on its side like that. And to make it worse, it's not just that Uranus is spinning on its side, its rings are also sideways, and so the, the moons also orbit sideways. That is really tough for evolutionists to explain. But, you know, God can do what he wants. If he wants to make a planet tilt it on its side, he's certainly free to do that. Now, Russ Humphreys predicted uh, a number for what we call the magnetic moment of Uranus. Okay, the magnetic moment is just a number that gives you a rough estimate of the size of the magnetic field. And sure enough, when... Voyager 2 flew by in 1986. He turned, it was, he was right. Okay, he got it right. Now, the evolutionists were way off, okay, but he got it right. And he basically took the Bible seriously. And based on 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 5, he concluded that God made the heavenly bodies out of water. And he made some pretty simple physical assumptions. He turned the crank, and he was able to successfully predict the approximate size of Uranus's magnetic field. Now, this is Neptune. Neptune is interesting because it's losing energy very rapidly. It's, it's losing about two and a half times as much energy per unit time as it receives from the sun. And, you know, that seems kind of weird if it's billions of years old. Okay, why, why, is, why does it still have all this energy? Now, maybe, maybe evolutionists can explain that, but what really bothers them is that Uranus and Neptune are so different. Okay, Uranus... Is losing all, it's got almost no excess heat. But Neptune has a lot of excess heat. And they think that because they form, supposedly, at the, near, in the outer reaches of the solar system, they should be very similar. But they're not. And that's a problem for the story they're telling. Now, he also, Russ Humphreys also predicted that the magnetic moment for Neptune would be about the same as Uranus. And sure enough, when Voyager 2 flew by in 1989, he was right. Okay, so he's made some successful predictions. Now, you may have heard people say, oh, creationists never make any predictions. That's not true. Okay, we've made num a number of successful predictions over the years. Now, you may wonder, how are the evolutionists doing? Well, uh, this is what one physicist wrote in 1989. He said, you would have thought we would have given up guessing about planetary magnetic fields after being wrong at nearly every planet in the solar system. <laughs> Okay, so they don't have a good track record, okay? And this is a clue that we creationists are on the right track. Now, we don't want to forget dwarf planet Pluto. You know, it got demoted not too long ago. It used to be a planet. Now they're calling it a dwarf planet. And we learned a lot about Pluto and its large moon Charon, or Charon, uh, when the New Horizons spacecraft flew by. Uh, now, most of you have probably seen these photos where you have that big heart shape on Pluto, uh, there was not a single crater on the left lobe of that heart. And 
scientists concluded that it couldn't be more than 10 million years old. And remember, the planets are supposed to be billions of years old. And they think that something happened, somehow there was some, something happened to resurface that part of Pluto. And I think that's reasonable because even in a 6,000 year old universe, you know, you would expect maybe a few meteorites to hit that section. So the fact that it's so clean and devoid of features like that seems to really suggest that something happened. There was some geological event that resurfaced that part of Pluto. The problem for them is that takes heat, okay? And they don't understand how Pluto could stay warm for four billion years. Okay, well, of course, we think we know the answer. Pluto's not billions of years old. And it's kind of funny, the lead researcher for New Horizons, it's almost like he knew we creationists were going to pounce on this, and he said, uh, you know, we can't appeal to young, uh, a young system to explain energy sources. Okay, in other words, don't try to tell us that Pluto and its moon Charon are young. And I'm saying, well, why not? Okay, just because you evolutionists have a hang-up on this, there's no reason we can't use this explanation. And that's the reason. It's young. Uh, now, of course, we got our young skeptic here, okay? She hasn't gone away. She says, oh, well, that's all well and good, but I still want to know about distant starlight. So let's talk a little bit more about distant starlight. Now, when you get into this issue of distant starlight, you're talking about something called cosmology, which deals with the origin and the large-scale structure of the universe. And the problem with cosmology is you can't do it without making assumptions. Like it or not, you have to make assumptions. Okay, even um, very atheistic scientists like Stephen Hawking have admitted this, okay? You have to make assumptions. Now, there's a misconception out there that the laws of physics prevents or prevent distant starlight from reaching Earth quickly. That's not quite right, okay? They pre the rules prevent light from getting here quickly if you make some assumptions, okay? In fact, even physicists who are not creationists have acknowledged it is theoretically possible for distant starlight to get here in no time at all. If you want to learn more about it, you might want to look up that YouTube video, Why No One Has Measured the Speed of Light, okay? And creationists have come up with models to explain distant starlight getting here quickly. Uh, now, I don't think we've necessarily got the right answer yet. Okay, now Russ Humphreys is the guy who kicked this all off with this book of his, Starlight and Time, that was published in 1994. Now, there are some other creation scientists who don't think his mechanism can provide, can get it quite to work. Okay, but he's got some new ideas that have come out that I'm kind of intrigued by, and you should be reading about that pretty soon in Acts and Facts. But a lot of creationists think Einstein's theory of relativity is the key to solving this problem. And, of course, relativity theory, you know, that, that's where you get these weird effects where clocks can di tick at different rates depending on differences in gravity or differences in relative speeds between objects, okay? And a lot of, and pretty much every creation-based explanation for distant starlight uses relativity theory in some way. Now, I know some Christians are suspicious of relativity theory. Uh, they think it was something concocted by Satan. Uh, but it, really, relativity theory is our friend as creationists, okay? It may help us explain uh, this, this, this issue. Now, if you think Satan invented quantum mechanics, that I can understand, okay? But relativity theory is our friend, okay? And again, it raises the possibility that clocks could tick at different rates, that clocks in deep space could tick much faster than clocks here on Earth. And that would have given the light time to get here, but as measured by clocks on Earth, the entire universe is just 6,000 years old. And I think about the, the Bible allows for this. Okay, we know clocks can tick at different rates. Okay, that's an experimental observed fact. And the Bible, when it's talking about the days of creation, it's clearly measured with respect to time on earth. You know, the Lord says over and over and over again in Genesis 1, in the evening and the morning were the first day, and the evening and the morning were the second day, and the evening and the morning were the third day. This is all measured by sunrise and sunset on Earth. And the Bible was written for people on Earth. It was not written for people out in deep space. Now, we haven't nailed down all the details on this issue, but we've got good options. And this is not the insurmountable objection to biblical creation that people think it is. Uh, in fact, you could argue that it's already been solved in principle 
although we may not yet have a solution that explains all the observations all the astronomical data that's what makes this hard ok but guess what the big bang has a similar problem you might think because you watch TV that the big bang does explain all the observations and that is not true in fact the big bang has its own version of this light travel time problem and this is the reason that something called inflation was tacked onto the big bang model and inflation is this idea that the universe went through this hyper accelerated growth spurt early in its history it's basically a miracle okay it's the secular equivalent equivalent of a miracle and they tacked it onto the big bang model to solve really some problems that were potentially fatal now there's a zero evidence for inflation okay and inflation theory has gotten so weird that some of the former advocates now for it are now harshly criticizing it okay but there's also another problem and that is that extremely distant galaxies look more mature than you would expect of the big bang is true and let, let me just kind of explain this remember they're assuming that distant light takes a long time to reach us okay so you know, if you've got light from very far away, it's going to take billions of years to reach us. So what about the very farthest galaxies? I mean, you've got galaxies out there that supposedly, uh, you know, we're seeing light from them that was emitted just a few hundred million years after the supposed Big Bang. Now, if that's the case, we should not be observing these far, far away galaxies as they are today, but as they were billions and billions of years ago, right? Okay, I, saw, I see somebody got my little goat back there. <laughs> the rest of you may not be, be uh, paying attention. but So that means that distant galaxies, they shouldn't look mature. They ought to look immature. They ought to look unevolved. Well, guess what? That expectation is routinely contradicted. Okay, routinely. So that tells me there's either something wrong about their ideas about how galaxies evolve over time, or there's something wrong with the assumption that distant starlight takes billions of years to reach us, or maybe both, okay? Uh, so, you know, I will admit that the strongest arguments for an old universe involve objects that are in deep space, but that's where our knowledge is the weakest, where we have to make the greatest assumptions, okay? So these age estimates are even weaker than evolutionary age estimates for things here on Earth. Now, interestingly enough, even though deep space objects give us their greatest argument for an old universe, even some deep space objects look a lot younger than they're supposed to. Uh, for instance, you've got planets in other solar systems, what we call exoplanets, that often look too young, much younger than they're supposed to be by evolutionary reckoning. Uh, there are some exoplanets out there that they call hot J Jupiters and hot Neptunes, they're called hot because they're really close to their host stars. And they're called Nep Jupiters and Neptunes because they're gas giants like our planet, Jupiter and Neptune. Well, one of these hot Neptunes is so close to its host star, its atmosphere is literally evaporating. Now, they believe that that system, that, that planet and star are about 2 billion years old. And the problem for them is that if that, that were really the case, the atmosphere could be completely gone by now. But it's not. Okay, that's a clue that this is younger than what they're telling us. Also, you have some objects in space called globular clusters that are just gorgeously beautiful. They're like celestial snow globes in space. And we've got about 150 of these orbiting our own Milky Way galaxy. Now, you know, you saw that they're rotating there. You know, the star, you know, they, they often rotate, okay? And that's true not just for the stars on the outer edges, but for the stars near the center, where you have a lot of stars that are really close together. And they're, they appear, they're rotating around a common axis, you know, kind of rotating like that. The problem for them is because these stars are so close together, when, when, you know, when they pass each other, they exert gravitational tugs on each other, and that alters their trajectories just a little bit. And over time, they get uh, the trajectory. I'm sorry, trajectories get adjusted a little bit more, and eventually, that motion is going to be erased after a few hundred million years. And yet, evolutionists claim that globular clusters are some of the oldest objects in the universe, around 11 billion years old. Okay, 
I, I, really, I think this is something uh, that is a big problem, and I'm a little surprised that creationists haven't made a bigger deal about this, okay? But this is another thing that looks a lot younger than what they're claiming. So I hope this has been an encouragement to you, okay? Recent creation is reasonable. It's more reasonable than the Big Bang because our solar system really looks young even when you make assumptions that are favorable to evolution. Creation scientists have made a bunch of successful predictions by taking the Bible seriously. That's a clue we're on the right track. And also, even though we haven't nailed down all the details yet, we've got plausible answers to hard questions like how, how can we see distant starlight in a young universe. However, the best way to date something is reliable eyewitness testimony. Think about, you know, if you didn't, if your parents had not told you when you were born, or you did not have a birth certificate, you might have trouble estimating your own age, let alone someone else's. Okay? The best way to date something is reliable eyewitness testimony. And the Lord Jesus himself is the ultimate reliable eyewitness. He's the faithful and true witness. He never lies. He never makes a mistake. And he's the creator. If anybody knows how old the universe is, he does. And we ought to listen to what he says. Um, in fact, there are three places in the Gospels where the Lord Jesus, in his earthly ministry, implicitly affirms a recent creation. One of those is in Mark chapter 10, verse 6, where he says, But from the beginning of the creation, God made them, that is, Adam and Eve, male and female. Not billions of years after an alleged Big Bang, but from the beginning of the creation. Uh, we ought to take his word for it. And I want to just show you these images because they're just so beautiful. And the Lord Jesus Christ deserves the glory for that. Not nature, not the Big Bang. He deserves the glory for making those celestial wonders. Uh, those are some of the sources I use to kind of put together the images in this talk. And if you'd like to learn more, we've got lots of resources. We've got our Creation Basics, Basics and Beyond, which is a really good overview of the creation evolution debate. Uh, it's great for middle school, high school, and college kids as well as adults. Covers pretty much everything, and it's written for lay people, but it's got footnotes if you'd like to delve a little bit deeper into these topics. We've also got a great series of DVDs called What You Aren't Being Told About Astronomy. They have beautiful images in them, and they've got rave reviews from parents, from grandparents, and even professional scientists. And uh, these just eviscerate the Big Bang story. I mean, it, it's just, it's, it's funny, actually. And uh, the guy who made these, uh, the Spike Pissaris, he, he, he's really witty, and he, he pokes fun at them a little bit. Uh, we've also got the book Guide to the Universe, if you'd like to learn more uh, about astronomy in the Bible and how astronomy confirms creation. And we've also got some resources for kids, if you would like those as well. We've also got one of our ICR planetarium shows on DVD, so you can watch it at home. Now, to completely change subjects here, most of my real hardcore research I've done at ICR up to this point involves the ice age and climate change. And we've got some booklets on those subjects if you'd like to learn more. Uh, and I, or I don't think we should be panicking over this issue of global warming, warming, and I explain why in that little booklet. And then the other book with the Ice Age and the Flood, we talk about uh, the ice cores and why the ice cores don't prove millions of years, even though Bill Nye, the science guy, thinks they do, and uh, how the Ice Age fit, fits into biblical history. But if you really want to go in-depth, we've got this new book, The Ice Age and Climate Change, which really covers this topic in-depth. Um, and I give specific examples of where evolutionary beliefs are contributing to alarmism about climate and where they're they're misinterpreting the data because of their evolutionary beliefs and i also again get into this uh, subject of the ice cores and uh, spent a lot of time explaining how the ice age fits into biblical history uh, we've also got a, a dvd series called universe a journey through god's grand design and i want to just show you a little preview here of that DVD series. I think we have one left. <laughs> okay. But maybe somebody will go ahead and buy it. I think you can also download it as well. Uh, it looks like we're not getting the audio here. Uh, but uh, you can hopefully kind of get a, get a feel for um, what that looks like. But it's a four-part DVD series. And it kind of talks about the history of astronomy uh, from a creation perspective. 
so if you like that, we've also got our magazine action facts. please, if you aren't signed up for that, please do so. it's free to you. it is paid for by our donors. it is a gift to you and lord willing in the next episode, in the next issue, we're going to be talking about addition of starlight and so if you ever come down to dallas, please visit visit us at the discovery center for science and earth history. Uh, i think you'll find it very uh, uh encouraging as well as informative. You know, we got animatronic dinosaurs. We got an animatronic T-Rex. And uh, and we got a planetarium. We got some really cool stuff to show you. So I hope this little talk has been an encouragement to you. And I'll hand it uh, back over to uh, the pastor. Thank you.